Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we take a closer look at the week's top political stories. Ballotpedia connects people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for being with us. Today, we're joined by Dr. Shauna Riley, who's an author and political science professor at Northern Kentucky University. Dr. Riley teaches classes on American politics, political behavior, and state politics, and her research focuses on direct democracy and the accessibility of election materials to voters. Shauna, thanks so much for being with us. Happy to be here. So like I said, ballot measures are my day job, so I'm really excited (laughs) to nerd out with you today. Can you tell us a little bit about what got you interested in politics and then direct democracy more specifically? So I grew up in Canada um, and I came to um, political fruition or, you know, political interest in the mid 90s during the Quebec referenda on whether or not Quebec should separate or not. And unfortunately, they did not write the question do you want to leave Canada or not? It was much more convoluted than that. And I I don't know that it necessarily impacted the campaign, but it was certainly something that sort of stuck in my head about, well, why didn't you just say, do you want to leave Canada? That seems Mm -hmm. like a pretty straightforward question versus all the stuff about passports and money and all of that. Just make it simple. (laughs) They never do, but... No, it's never simple. Uh, And so that was sort of something that played a large part in my sort of political socialization about Canada, about Quebec, about politics. And so when I went to graduate school, my advisor worked on ballot measures at the state level in the U.S. And I thought, well, makes sense. I'll start there. And so it kind of worked out that that's that's how I fell into this. And a few years later, it's what I still do. That's good. Like I, I fell into it too. I applied to Ballotpedia and they're like, we have an opening on the ballot measures team. And I ended up loving it. So ballot measures just find you, I guess. We'll be spending most of our time today talking about your research, but I figured we should start with a little bit of a primer in direct democracy. If you could describe for our listeners, what is a ballot measure? So a ballot measure is simply a policy question that is asked to voters, and it can come from a variety of places. So it can come from the legislature where they're asking voters to vote on something. Sometimes they're required to do that, but other times it's because they don't want to take the political front for it. They want voters to make the decision. Sometimes it's suggested by a citizen. So citizens go out and collect signatures and put something on the the ballot to get folks to vote on. Uh, Those are a wide variety of things, of different corporate sponsorship, individuals. It kind of comes from the whole gamut. We've even seen some that were sponsored by governors that went around the political process. So that kind of has a cool lineage all in itself. So those are kind of the two main ways that we get them on the ballot. And it's more about asking voters to vote on a policy issue. So what do you think? Should we do this? Should we not do this? Sometimes it's not quite that simple, but (laughs) it's asking voters to give their their assent to different policy. Right. Veto referendums always trip me up because it's not just like, do you want this policy? It's like, do you want to repeal it, uphold it? The yes, no gets pretty confusing for voters. So yes, if I get anything else out of my entire work, it's just, can we simplify it? Like this is what yes means straight up. Are there any states with really unique ways as far as like the initiative process goes for getting ballot measures on the ballot? I don't know that there's anything that's too specific about a specific state that sticks out to me. When I did some research on who the petitioners were, that was really interesting to me. So I had a a fellow who was interested in getting seatbelt laws changed. Now, we all have seatbelt laws, right? But at the time, that was something he put on the ballot in his state because his wife was killed in a car wreck and she wasn't wearing a seatbelt. So it was a personal issue. He wanted to make sure everyone was safe, put it on the ballot several years later, everyone has to wear a seatbelt. So it's kind of cool that like that man's one sort of agenda item got there. Um, I also talked to um, someone who was in prison that had petitioned, he couldn't vote, but he could petition to put something on the ballot from prison. Who knew that? (laughs) So it's just who those folks are and their background and why they want that route is kind of a cool story. Yeah. Have you heard about the ferret guy in California who's like tried to put a few initiatives on the California ballot trying to legalize the pet ownership of ferrets? I think he ended up moving to Mexico because it was illegal. It's been an interesting one to follow. Certainly lots of folks come at this from various perspectives. Yeah. Your research on ballot question readability actually sparked our own analysis on it. Can you describe for our listeners a little bit about what readability is and why you decided to study it? So when you um, finish a document in Word and you push spell check, it comes up with some statistics that say, hey, 
did you know this is hard to read or this is easy to read or 12th grade, sixth grade, those kinds of things. And so when you are in graduate school and you are trying to make great papers come alive that you know are well-written, you use that button a lot. Anyways, it sparked some interest as to like, hmm, I wonder if we put these ballot questions through this, what it would look like. Uh, I actually found other scholars who had done that before me, so I'm, I'm not the first, but um, working from sort of Magleby's research, which had done far earlier uh, in the 80s, and he had only had access to grade 12 data. Like that, that was as far as the, the measurements went. We now go a lot further in that. Um, and so what we're looking at is essentially like how many syllables, how many sentences, how many words, and they're putting it through an algorithm to come out with a score. For grade level, it tells you how many years of education you would need to be able to read it. And the readability score is sort of a little more nuanced. How does this read? But it can also be translated into the grade level. So the idea being that if you have a college degree or a high school diploma, you should be able to access this. In one of your articles, you kind of investigate how the harder a measure is to read, the more likely voters are to not vote on it. So why did that end up being the case, you think? You know, it's funny when we think about readability or ease of reading, a lot of times we think, oh, if we make it sound legal or we make it sound, you know, very professional, that will convince voters that our way. When it actually has the opposite effect, right? That if you don't understand what you're voting on, instead of just saying, sure, they must know what they're talking about, it says, I don't know what this is and I'm just not going to vote on it or I'm going to vote against it, uh, which sometimes plagues us in various ways, depending on our outcomes. And so, you know, the manipulation of voters goes so far that maybe they're going to say no because you tried to trick them. Mm-hmm. Or not vote at all. and then Or not, not vote at all and just let your measure fail. <laughs> in our most recent analysis for 2022, average statewide ballot measure readability score was 19, which equates to a third year graduate school level. I only have 18 years, so I feel a little underqualified for my job. But there are some efforts at the legislative level to enhance readability of ballot measures. For instance, in March, the North Dakota legislature passed a law requiring ballot language to be written in, quote, plain, clear, understandable language using words with common everyday meaning, end quote. Do you think we'll see more of these in other states and will it have an impact or is it kind of unenforceable in a way? I think it's what's plain and understandable language, right? Like, what does that mean? When it comes to policy, a lot of words that make sense in the policy world or for policy wonks makes sense, right? So what we think about them looking at, or um, my favorite one is homesteading. There are a ton of homestead ballot measures and it's about taxes, but that's not how it reads up front. Like it's homestead this, homestead that, get this tax break, you get that tax break. Just tell me how long I have to have lived in my house and how I had to like create that relationship with the state to get the tax break. That's all it does. But a lot of the, the legalese comes into that. And so at what point do we sort of pass from the, this is the legal language that defines exactly what we mean and has repercussions to live in your house for 20 years, sign this form, 3% tax break. I, I can see both arguments for that, like how you want it to, to really be the entire wording. But if we're asking citizens who don't have three years of graduate school to try and figure out what the ballot question says, kind of hurting ourselves in that regard. It's kind of interesting, too, with some ballots include just the question and then others have a summary where it is trying to be more everyday language. And even those summaries can have high readability scores. So it's like in the midterm elections in November where I voted, they had the ballot measure and then the like description posted on the wall. And it was not simple. It was multiple pages and people were going up and and one was essentially like allowing abortions to be constitutional, but that's not what it all words. <laughs> and so just trying to think of the complicate, we make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be sometimes, but there are complications that come with making policy. And related to laws governing ballot measures like that one I just described, Ballotpedia tracks the number of laws that are enacted each year that change the process. Are there any newly enacted changes that interest you regarding ballot measures or even like single subject requirements that was passed recently in Arizona or distribution requirements where like, I believe it's in Arkansas that they, they increase the number of counties that you have to go through to get their signatures. The one thing I love about teaching state politics is I always have to answer with, it depends, right? Like it depends on the jurisdiction. It depends on the state, like how we do things. I'm not super familiar with anything that's long-term change that's made 
groundbreaking differences across multiple states. We see states try things and then other states follow along and then sort of go in different directions. But uh, I think we're making positive changes if we're talking single topic because it helps with readability. Distribution requirements, that's a, a state issue for states that are deeply divided or have differences within their districts. So I think it depends depends on the state, which yeah. is a very unsatisfying answer. And I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> That's what I tell my students all the time. No, I think it's a very valid answer. You wrote a book in 2010 called Design, Meaning, and Choice in Direct Democracy that tried to unpack what you see as a paradox with direct democracy. That paradox being these measures hold so much power for citizens to participate and weigh in on our democracy, yet there has consistently been low turnout in ballot measure elections. What else factors into whether or not voters choose to weigh in on ballot measures other than readability? It depends on the long line. So if you get to the top, the front of the line and you have been in line for an hour, you're not going to vote all the way down the ballot. You're going to vote for the top race and get out, right? Or whatever race you came to vote for. We also see if they are long ballots. The longer the ballot, the less likely people are to participate. It depends if it's a presidential year, a midterm year. Kentucky is about to have a, a gubernatorial race here. So it's another level of elections that, you know, sort of different than usual. Are they on people's radars? When we think about all of the information we get about elections, we don't often see a lot of campaign commercials about ballot measures, or at least not all of them. So you might get surprised when you get to the ballot measure and go, what is this? And just leave it. So there's lots of factors that contribute to whether or not someone votes all the way down the ballot and votes on those questions. Sure. I feel like one of those factors too is the topics that concern them. So topics that are a little bit more controversial will probably drive up that voter turnout. Are there ballot measure topics in recent elections that have received more voter participation? So in 2004, which is not recent, I appreciate that. And I was thinking it's now like almost 20 years. It feels like it was recent. Uh, (laughs) It feels like it was just yesterday. So the sort of more genius perspective, depending on how you feel about all kinds of things, politics, I think it's good to think about the strategy, not necessarily the outcome, was to put ballot measures on swing states about gay marriage. And so what it did was it got conservative voters who maybe didn't care for the candidate or didn't care to reelect the candidate uh, out to vote. They voted for gay marriage. And while they were there, let's vote for Bush. We saw that in in the 2010s with marijuana legalization. It it certainly helped re-election campaigns those years for Democrats. I think one of the things we've seen in the last year or two are the abortion ones, um, which here in Kentucky failed. That that was not expected that an abortion measure here in Kentucky would fail to make it unconstitutional. And so I think we'll see some more of that issue coming into the 2024 election, both to codify or not codify abortion rights. I'd like to see what else comes up. So we've seen a lot of discussion about gun rights. Or is someone going to try and do that with the ballot measure? There's always these these wedge issues that if you can get sort of a trend going across the state, across the country. Those are fun to see and what the sort of outcomes are going to be, what folks are going to turn out for, because we're going to have two interesting candidates, whomever they may eventually be. Are those the ones voters want or are there going to be other reasons that they go out to vote? Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. I mean, a good example, going back to that abortion topic is Kansas, when they voted in August 2022 on that constitutional amendment, we saw more voters vote on the amendment than vote in the gubernatorial or U.S. Senate primaries. That's kind of unheard of. shouldn't happen. Yeah. (laughs) So it definitely depends on the topic for sure. It does. Um, And if my students came back with that data, I would tell them to go check it again because never (laughs) is that the case. But I know I double checked it before I came on today. I was like, really? By by 100,000 votes, it's not a sizable little majority voted more was 100,000 votes more. Republicans are in charge of more state legislatures now than in the past. In the 80s and 90s, Democrats are more in control. And as a re- result, we've seen Democrats turn to the ballot measure to advance some of their policies, whereas in the 80s and 90s, where it was reversed, more Republicans used ballot measures to achieve their policy work. Is this something you've noticed in your own research? I haven't looked at so much about sponsorship in terms of ideological perspectives, but it makes sense that if you can't pass measures or laws through the chamber or sort of through the traditional format that you go to the citizens. It also creates some citizen swell around your topics that might help you down the road with elections that like, we brought you this topic, we brought you this topic. This is what the people of Kansas or Kentucky or whatever state want. Now is the time to enact that policy when you go to run for governor or state legislature. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to watch from the sidelines. We've talked about some of the higher profile ballot measures being featured on ballots, but are there any other trends or themes you're looking at in the ballot measure world? Um, I think I'm just sort of curious as to what's going to happen next. I know that sounds like a a very sort of hands-off discussion, but, you know, we're coming up to a presidential election. We're about 18 months out-ish. Math's bad. 
but 18 ish months. Um, and so what, what, what is it going to happen? What, what are the topics that people are going to be talking about? We've had lots of hot topics with immigration, those types of issues, but what is going to galvanize people to actually get out and put those on the ballot? For sure. I think it's also interesting, like what failed in 2022 and if that'll come back in 2024. So like sports betting in California that failed dramatically. Will it come back in 2024? Or even if the legislature will accept the outcome, whatever that may be. Uh, I know there's been some discussion. Well, we appreciate what folks voted on, but this is still how we're going to go for it at that tension. We asked this question to all of our external guests. What's your argument for why everyday Americans should even be paying attention to ballot measures and not just ballot measures in their own state, but across the country? So the original Greek model of democracy said that we all got this vote on all policies, all laws, which is unattainable with the size of our population now. This is an opportunity for us to have a voice on specific laws, but it's also our opportunity to petition to put them on the ballot if that's allowed in your state. And it's also our opportunity to see why they want my vote on those issues. So what's the motivation behind putting this on a ballot versus just voting through the legislature? Like, can it not pass? Do you not want to vote on it? I, I always enjoy the motivation behind things. That's sort of my my joy of ballot measures, but this is our opportunity to have a voice. Oftentimes it's not one we take advantage of. We don't vote on all of the things because I don't know about blueberry subsidies. Why doesn't affect me, but this is a time that the government has asked us or lets us have a voice. And so I think it's a really crucial component of our democracy that everyone should take advantage of in like voting, not manipulation. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today about ballot measures, nerding out. And for our listeners who want to check out more of Dr. Riley's work, they can click on the link in our show notes. We've also included some links about our ballot measure coverage. Make sure you subscribe to On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.